Using your 3D printer requires a good understanding of the slicing software, but sometimes the best features are those that lie beneath the surface. So join me in uncovering some lesser known slicer tips. You can't 3D print without a slicer, and most people will learn just enough to get going and then leave it there. But as you'll see in this video, with submissions from my patrons, slicing software has some powerful secrets that can take your workflow to the next level. Unfortunately, all slicers have different features with different pros and cons. So what might exist in one slicer won't exist in all. But maybe if there's a feature you see in this video, you can request that your slicer of choice implements it. Some of these features are currently only available in the alpha versions of Prusa Slicer, but since Super Slicer, Bamboo Studio and Orca Slicer are all derived from that, hopefully they trickle down in time. If you can't find any of these settings, make sure that you've downloaded and installed the latest version of your slicing software. And for Prusa Slicer, that means going to the GitHub and downloading an alpha version instead of one of the stable releases. Let's get into our first tip, which is all about efficiency and that's using max volumetric flow. In your slicer, under the speed section, you might have a lot of different ways that this value is broken up, with variations for perimeters, infill, supports, bridge, and more. Rather than go through and edit these one at a time if you want to speed things up or slow them down, consider using auto speed, which uses a max volumetric flow rate to limit the speed naturally. There are several free ways that you can calculate this max volumetric flow rate. I've linked them below, including a test on my free calibration website, a page and video from CNC Kitchen with a specific process, and a video I have on the built-in calibration for Orca Slicer, which has now been updated to have a test for max volumetric flow rate. Whatever method you use, they'll give you concrete values that you can enter into the slicer, and keep in mind that this value will vary depending on the type of filament you're doing, with something soft like TPU generally being much lower. Is a humble calibration cube sliced with this feature turned off. Instead of color coding by feature type, let's set it to volumetric flow rate. And we can see that the highest values in this print are somewhere around 24 millimeters cubed per second. Now let's come back to our print settings and put in a cap of 20 millimeters cubed per second. If we re-slice, you'll see that everything has been scaled and our max value is 19.3. Here's a before and after comparison, this time color coding by speed. We can see internally that we had a max feed rate of 200 millimeters per second. But when we lower the max volumetric flow rate, we can see that all of our speeds are scaled down with a maximum value now of 132.6 millimeters per second. This is particularly handy for a quick change if you've got a rather hard material to print that needs a slower feed rate. However, when you put it this slow, you'll no longer have a distinction between infill perimeters and other parts of the print. But when you're going this slow, that probably won't matter. The example I've shown thus far is in Super Slicer, but the same setting is also found in Prusa Slicer under Speed. In Simplify 3D, if we come to Speeds, we can then tick the box to enable this option and enter a value in the box. In Bamboo Studio and Orca Slicer, you won't find it in the print settings, but instead have to go into your filament settings. And then at the bottom of the filament tab, you'll have a max volumetric speed, which works exactly the same way. Cura unfortunately doesn't have this setting by default, but it has been added in a community fork. I'll link this thread below as it has some information on compiling this version yourself. Next up, a different amount of first layer squish to suit different filaments with global G-code offsets. Different filaments might require a slightly different amount of squish for the first layer. And to do this, we would normally change the Z offset, but it's pretty inconvenient as the print is starting to try and memorize these different offsets and make the adjustments on the fly for perfect results. One slicer in Simplify 3D has an alternate solution for this. In our profile, if we come to output, we can enter a global offset for our G-code. Normally you would leave it on zero, but you can raise or lower the first layer and the rest of the print that follows by changing the Z-axis value. You can then save different profiles with a reference to that filament to have that global Z offset baked in. As the name suggests, a global offset is applied to all of the Z values. So for instance, a first layer height of 0.24 millimeters is actually produced at 0.34 millimeters to take into account the 0.1 millimeter offset that I added. I know it won't be for everyone, but this is one feature I'd like to see brought to other slices 
perhaps tied to the filament section. Let me know if you agree in the comment section. How about a more intelligent way to stop the nozzle from knocking off the model in Spiral Z Hop? This is something I investigated myself, making a whole video about previously. And that was in response to trying to print this overhang egg from E3D, where the steep edges would curl up, collide with the nozzle and make the print fail. My diagonal Z Hop method got the print to finish, but still with more stringing than without Z Hop which sparked a good conversation in the comments about the best strategy for intelligent Z-Hop. But little did I know, there was a similar feature already present in Bamboo Studio and Orca Slicer. If we come up to our printer settings, and then to the extruder section, we can see that we have multiple options for Z-Hop type, including spiral. If we slice the model and preview the G-code, we can see exactly what that entails. The nozzle will lift up in a circular spiral before traveling to the new section and dropping down vertically. From here, it will continue printing as normal. We can see from this preview that this uses a G3R command with an added Z value. So how well does it work? Unsurprisingly, the version sliced without any Z hop active, curled up and was knocked loose from the bed. Apart from this, it looks okay and is pretty much string free. Our spiral Z hop version managed to complete without any issues and without significant stringing. There's perhaps a little bit more here than usual, but it's still pretty sparse. So this setting is definitely worthwhile, but just keep in mind that it will add time to your print. For instance, an extra nine minutes for this one. Let's consider practicality, saving time, but not compromising strength by combining infill across layers. Here we have some chunky brackets. They need to be strong. So I've turned up the infill percentage to help with that. And we can see the print time is two hours and 20 minutes. If we come to print settings and then infill, we can see that under reduce printing time, combine infill every is set to the default of one layers. If we untick supporting dense layer, we can then increase this value and re-slice the model. Although it looks the same, we can see that our print time has dropped by 40 minutes to one hour and 41. And if we change our view from feature type to layer height, we can see what's going on here. All of our external layers are printed at a standard 0.2 millimeter layer height but all of our infill is printed every second layer, but at twice the thickness, coming in at roughly 0.4 millimeters. So we save so much time because the infill is printed exactly half as often. And because of these big, thick, chunky extrusions, we should be able to get away with turning down the infill to a lower percentage while still retaining similar strength, but shaving off an extra 10 minutes. There is of course a limit to how many layers you can bind the infill for. This printer has a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, so we can't extrude any thicker than that, and the thickest layers still stay at around 0.4 millimeters. In Prusa Slicer, this is found in the same section. Bamboo Studio and Orca Slicer have a simplified version called Infill Combination. Simplify 3D has it in the infill section under Combined Infill Layers. And in Cura, the setting is called Infill Layer Thickness, and we can get the equivalent of two layers by doubling whatever the layer height is. This one's an oldie, but a goodie, and I'm not sure how many people are aware of it. You've probably heard of fuzzy skin, but how about applying it intelligently? Cura first introduced fuzzy skin, and it can be found in the experimental section. If we turn it on and then slice, we can see that our outer perimeters are no longer smooth, but instead quite wavy. This cube is a nice demonstration, but I'm not sure anyone needs a fuzzy calibration cube, so let's look at something more practical. This is a grip I designed a few years ago. I'm gonna right click on it and go to add modifier. For now, I'm just going to add a slab. I can position the slab using the usual tools for rotate, scale, and move. If I position this slab to overlap just part of the handle, I can then right click, come to add settings, and then select fuzzy skin. I'm going to tick all three options as I wanna edit each of them. And then in the bottom right, I'll turn fuzzy skin to external walls and I want a finer texture. So I'm going to lower the percentages of the two options. Now, when I slice, you can see that fuzzy skin is not applied to the whole model, but is instead constrained to where the two parts overlapped. Of course, there's nothing to stop us from making in our CAD a model that closer fits the contour that we want. And then when we add our modifier, we can go to load and select that file and the coordinates should automatically match. I'm going to apply the same fuzzy skin options as before for this modifier. And with this workflow, the fuzzy skin application looks even better. And in my opinion, the real world print looks even better than that. Those lower percentage values give a finer texture and this handle offers quite a lot of grip. 
Something like this would be very tricky to model in CAD. This one's available in Prusa Slicer and all of its derivatives, including Bamboo Studio and Orca Slicer, where we need to come to the objects, click on our part, and then come to others to select fuzzy skin. I think everything so far is quite useful, but these last tips provide powerful model manipulation directly in the slicer. Everything you're about to see was always possible, it's just that you had to use one or more separate pieces of software other than the slicer. But now, in Prusa Slicer and Derivatives, this functionality is readily available. Let's start simple by adding holes and voids to a model. This one is available in Prusa Slicer and all of its derivatives. After we've imported our initial model, we can right click on it and then go down to add negative volume. We have a bunch of presets here and by clicking any of them, we can then use the regular tools to scale, rotate and move them into position. As this one's a negative volume, it's going to be like a Boolean cut on our original model. So when we click slice, we can see that the G code is generated as if that part of the model was never there. We have the option to load an entirely different SDL. For instance here, I've imported an SDL and set it to be a negative. So when I slice, all of a sudden I have what could be considered a mold. You'd probably orient this a different way for ideal printing, but I'm sure you get the idea. Perhaps the most common use of this will be adding simple holes for things like key rings. If we select a cylinder, we can then move it into position, use the scale tool to get it the right size, and after tweaking the position, we have a very quick and efficient way to add holes to existing STLs, and it's as if they were designed into the original model from the start. Let's step it up by adding text easily to existing models. This and the final tip are only available in Prusa Slicer Alphas, but hopefully they trickle down to the rest. Here are two STLs for a part I designed to go over a nut and bolt so it can be operated by hand. If we right click on either part, we can come to add part and then come to text. What follows is a really easy to understand interface. I'm gonna change this one to the letter A as if it was a label, and then I can easily make it bigger or smaller by changing the height and I can easily change how much it sticks up by changing the depth. Beyond that, I can just drag and move it to the model wherever I need it to be. Obviously, if you want to, you can change fonts and all sorts of things like that too. By default, we're set on join, and when we slice the model, our text is automatically embossed into the surface, once again as if we designed it from the start in CAD. Let's label the second piece, but this time do a variation. This time we're gonna change it to cut, and that's because this piece will sit flush on top of this, so I can't have anything protruding. Let's slice the model, and this time you can see that we have a negative letter on top. Personally, I think this is super quick and easy. Adding text can be used like any other modifiers. For example, here's a low poly fox, and I'm gonna add some text to it and drag it around to a better surface of the model. I'm gonna make the text bold, and this time set it to be a modifier. Like before, I can right click on that modifier, Add a setting and let's try our fuzzy skin once more. Now when we slice the model, we can see that a region of the perimeter has been turned into fuzzy skin where our text intersected. For something that takes less than a minute, this is an amazingly powerful tool. Whether you're adding labels for assembly or perhaps someone's name to a printed gift, this one is a total winner. Last but certainly not least, splitting large parts into smaller components with joiners and I made a video about this type of thing a long time ago using Mesh Mixer to cut up STLs and add joining pins. Now it can be done directly in Prusa Slicer Alpha. Let's say I've got a model that doesn't quite fit on the print bed. If we select the model and then on the left hand side, come to cut, a dialogue will open that'll give us a plane to cut the model in half. Everything is color coded into object A and B and we can decide whether we wanna keep one or the other or both. I'm gonna keep my orientation for both, and if we perform the cut, we now have two separate objects that we can print one at a time. However, this gets more powerful once we add connectors. We have two options here, a plug or a dowel, and we need to click on the surface of the cut to place either of these. It's easy to change both the depth and diameter of these, and if we like, we can even change the shape. Once we're happy, we can click confirm connectors and perform our cut. So not only has the model been cut in half, but one side has a hollow, and the other side has a matching peg with a tolerance of our choice. It's worth playing with the different modes that we have. For instance here, a plug with a frustrum instead of a prism, 
and that gives a tapered shape that will print better without support in this orientation. I scaled this down before printing because this is just a proof of concept, but as you can see, the parts line up nicely and this would be ideal to assist with gluing. Slicing software has come a long way, but I'm even more excited about what's still to come. Thank you to my patrons for requesting and then contributing to this list. How many of these seven tips did you know? And have I missed out on any winners? Please let me know in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy getting more out of your 3D printing thanks to your slicer. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.